a lot of times people say, well, this is too good to be true. Well, no, it's insured. So there's right. a guarantee that is because of this insurance fund that if I die in 2009 or I live to be 100 and the house is upside down, my kids don't have to worry about paying the upside down amount. Hey, what's going on, Cashflow Hackers? It's Chris with Life 180, and uh, I am here for what is gonna be a really fun video. Um, I have Harlan Akala with me. He is the National Director for Reverse Mortgages with Fairway Independent Mortgage Corp. Did I say that right? You got it right. Awesome. So, so here's the deal. Um, I met Harlan here a couple days ago. We are at the NAFA, which is the National, National Association of Insurance and Financial Advisors. We're at the Apex 2022 conference here. We met each other, got introduced, um, and we've just had a good chance to get to know each other a little bit, talk, and he is obviously in the reverse mortgage space. A lot of people in the financial industry are leveraging and utilizing reverse mortgages as, an, as a a financial vehicle to, to increase the financial efficiency of people's lives. And um, fully transparently, I don't know a lot about them, right? Um, I've learned a little bit more because I just watched a presentation and uh, it spurred a lot of questions for me. And so I thought it would be really fun to do an interview with Harlan and um, ultimately pick your brain, um, have you give a little bit of an overview of what reverse mortgages are, kind of like how uh, they can help people, what problems they solve for people mm -hmm. as they hit retirement age, um, who they work for, who they don't, you know, maybe where some of the confusion points are of reverse mortgages, maybe why they, you know, you'll cover, cover some stuff about why they have a bad reputation mm -hmm. but in some people's minds and why that's unfair. Or, um, and then I also had some questions that were popping up in my mind as you were giving your presentation. Uh, and so we'll, we'll get into that as we go. Does Sounds that sound, great. sound good? That works so, for me. Full transparency, this is not scripted. Uh, we're, we're gonna come through. I'm probably gonna hit them with questions that I haven't even thought about yet. And um, my hope for this video is that if you're watching this and you're, you're wanting to learn about this reverse mortgage thing, see if it's right for you, if it's right for your parents, because like I'm 42, I think you gotta be 62 before you can do a reverse mortgage. So it's, I'm obviously 20 years out. I got parents, I've got in-laws, um, you know, that obviously it affects when we talk about generational wealth, that all comes into play, right? So um, having those conversations, understanding how this plays in the overall legacy planning, financial planning, retirement planning, everything. Uh, I, my hope for you is that you'll be on this journey with me. And as I ask questions, your hope, my hope is you're probably thinking the same questions as I'm asking them. So like, come on the journey. So here we go. So. Well, I think the biggest thing that you said is generational wealth. Yeah. And to understand reverse mortgages, you really need to understand forward mortgages. And people say, well, what's a forward mortgage? Totally. <laughs> it's the traditional mortgage where you make payments. Yep. So you, you're paying it forward. You're, you're doing a forward mortgage because you have to make payments for 30 years, 15 years, 20 years, whatever the term of your mortgage is. Mm -hmm. So my son just bought a house. He's 31. And him and Bridget, Josh and Bridget, bought this house. And he calls up and he said, hey, Dad, we just got finished closing on the house. Fairway made us sign a bunch of papers and uh, come over and help us move. And I hate moving, but I said, okay, we'll be over. <laughs> and um, Josh said, I just want you to know, Bridget and I have been listening to you. Of course, we read your book. And we know that we just started on our reverse mortgage. Okay. And he's 31. Okay. So how many 31-year-olds are going to leave the closing table when they haven't even made the first payment and say that? Only somebody that's been brainwashed by their father, obviously, for a number of years. <laughs> and so uh, he knows. He said, we're going to pay for the next 20, 30 years. Maybe we'll get a different house or whatever. Mm -hmm. But we're going to be pay paying into it, and we're starting on our retirement plan. And when we get to be 62 like you, we're going to be pulling money back out. Okay. Now, that's really radical. But what's the difference between that and a 401k? He started a 401k at work. Yep. He's going to put money in for the next 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And then when he gets to be 62 or 59 and a half or whatever, he can pull it out. Yep. Yep. But people don't look at houses that way. They never really have. And so when you talk about um, a reverse mortgage, a reverse mortgage is nothing more than a magic wand that turns the ability to change the purpose of a mortgage to getting money out mm -hmm. instead of putting money in. And you can't do that until you're old enough because it's age-based because you can't start a reverse mortgage at 30 because you would never be able to not make payments for 30 years or 60 years in that situation. But once you're 62, which is the magic age that FHA uh, uh, applied to the program back in, in 1988. Okay. And so you put money in and then a reverse mortgage is a safe way to pull money out, guarantee that you'll never get kicked out of your house 
without having to make those payments back in. Because everybody okay. knows you can take out a home equity line, mm -hmm. you pull money out, you put it back in. Yeah. You can do a cash out refi. So now your house went up in value, and instead of borrowing two hundred thousand, you buy borrow two fifty and use the fifty thousand to fund a business or do something else. Mm -hmm. So everybody understands how you take cash out, but you always got to pay it back. So if I pull out a line of credit for a hundred thousand and remodel my basement, then I got to pay back one hundred fifty. So it's not really cash flow. Sure. But when you get to be sixty two, you can pull it out and not put it back in, which is the ultimate hmm. ability to enjoy cash flow, to be able to use the money that you've deposited into a unique account called home equity, okay. which appears to be sacred. So when I read Garrett Gunderson's book, Killing Sacred Cows, yeah, yeah. debt and liabilities is mm -hmm. confused. So when I take money out of my house, it's not a debt as a reverse mortgage, it's a liability. Mm -hmm. But I still have the asset and I just don't have to pay it back in. Why can't I use the money that I've deposited into my house? Sure. Because ideological, cultural, we have been told you put money into your house and you never take it out because it's dangerous. That's, I mean, I, and from a dangerous perspective, you're worried. I mean, you just said you're guaranteed to not ever get kicked out of your house. Like, so I think psychologically speaking and sociological, like culturally, people want their house paid off because of the perception that they're safer, mm -hmm. right? By having your house paid off. Nobody, you use an example in your talk, like, People, you went to mortgage burning party when you were eight years old. Mm -hmm. Share that story real quick. Yeah, so, I mean, that was my first understanding of what a mortgage was. My dad took yeah. me to the mortgage burning party, mm -hmm. and uh, of course, they have a cheer when they light the thing on fire and drop it into the barbecue grill as we're, you know, uh, eating our brats and cheese curds in Wisconsin. And then I'm riding home with my dad, mm -hmm. and I said, well, What was this all about? I mean, what, what, why was everybody so happy? And he said, well, because that guy got rid of his mortgage and he never has to worry about the bank taking his house away. And when we get rid of our mortgage, you will never have to worry about being able to sleep in your bedroom at night. Mm. That was scary. Mm -hmm. You mean if we don't pay the mortgage, somebody's gonna come throw yeah. us out and I gotta sleep outside? Yeah. I mean, that, that was weird as an eight-year-old kid. Totally. And a lot of us were taught that. The mortgage burning parties were very normal back then. Now they have them for churches once in a while, but it's pretty rare to ever go to a mortgage burning party. And so, um, and that came about because people in the Depression, my dad was a, a, a little kid during the Depression, and he told me about Grandpa losing his farm. Mm. And that is a situation, it was in the movie It's a Wonderful Life that everybody watches at Christmas time, yeah. when the evil bank, the saving, a building and loan company, were kicking people out of their houses. And so that is so ingrained in people that if I get rid of a mortgage, then I'm safe. And the fact is, is that in the old days, that was true. Yeah. Now it's not because there's a mortgage product since 1988 that says, we'll give you money. You don't have to pay it back until you're 150 or when you permanently moved out, move out of the 150. house. 150. 150. But you're going to live to like 160, aren't you? What are well, you going to do? Then I'm going to have to find another spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hopefully we'll be able to refinance that. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. It. Perfect. Um, but, but that's really weird when you can pull money out and you don't have to pay it back until a year after your debt. Okay. In yeah. reality, yeah, everybody yeah. should really want that. Totally. Because yeah. it's the safest possible thing that you get money and you don't have to pay it back until after right. you're dead. Yeah. So that's, or whenever you permanently move out of the house. Mm -hmm. And so safety is uh, confused with the fact that, well, yes, I can live in my house if I pay my house off, but where's the safety in being able to use that money? There's no liquidity. Right. So I work with uh, some of the folks at Circle of Wealth and they use this thing called LUC, L-U-C, liquidity use and control. Love that. And money in your house is not liquid, it's not usable, and you are not in control of it. So to the people out there, you've talked about this, how, do, how would you, a lot of people say liquidity and use, they would think of those in the, in the same, like if it's liquid, I can use it. So how do, you, how do you differentiate those two? Well, liquidity is being able to get at the money instantly. Yep. Um, and that's what our line of credit is set up on, that okay. you can immediately, that money is liquid just like a savings account. You call us up and we just deposit the money into your bank account okay. with, within no, no more than five days. No, no applications. No. It's just like a, it's just a form you fill out. Yes. So th the way I'm hearing you talk about this, a reverse mortgage works a lot like a properly designed whole life insurance contract in the a way. Similarities like, there's are, a lot of similarities. The similarities are almost weird. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it's, it's because there's people that sell life insurance that don't like reverse mortgages, and there's people that sell reverse mortgages that don't like life insurance. <laughs> and if you like one, you should like both uh, totally. because they're very interrelated. Yeah. In fact, I the money that I did not put into my house, I put into life insurance contracts. Sure. Because I knew that that was liquid, whereas my equity was not. 
So when I was building equity when I was younger. So okay, so I have a million questions that are running through my head, and I'm just hoping I can keep them organized in a way that this will make sense. So getting to some of the technical thing before I forget, you know, where I'm at with this mentally. Somebody can get a reverse mortgage starting at 62. Mm-hmm. How much is there? Is there a, like a rule of thumb as far as how much equity they need to have in their house? Um, you know, like what, what are the kind of starting points? Right. So th- there are, are proprietary products in some states that you can get a reverse mortgage as early as 55. But okay. m- all states, to everybody that's uh, listening to the video, uh, 62 is universal because that's a okay. Federal Housing Administration product, okay. uh, FHA. So you turn 62 and you can get about half the equity in your house depending upon what uh, is the interest rate is and what uh, the age of your spouse and so on and so forth. Okay. My spouse was younger so I couldn't get 50% because she was younger. So the okay. younger your spouse, uh, the less that you get because they're guaranteeing her to stay in the house for the rest of her life. Got it. They're looking okay. at the age of the youngest borrower. Kind of like a second So if you like married this. a woman or a man that's 15 or 20 years younger than you, it's probably not as conducive. Right. It's younger spouses are expensive. <laughs> In, In a lot of ways. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so I turn 62 and I get somewhere between uh, 40 and 50%, depending upon the current interest rate. Mm-hmm. And I can use that in three ways. And this is where uh, I clearly categorize it for people in the financial planning world uh, and really anybody who's thinking about a reverse mortgage. Number one, I can use it to pay off an existing mortgage. Okay. That's what I did, is I yeah. took out a lump sum and paid off an existing mortgage. Okay. So I, don't, I didn't get any extra money out. I just paid off the existing mortgage so I could eliminate my payment for the rest of my life. You freed up cash flow. Exactly. Okay. So I refinanced from a forward mortgage to a reverse mortgage, which has optional payments for the rest of my life. I can still make them if I want to really? get a tax deduction. Okay. And I will, every three, four years, when the interest builds up, I'll launder some money, so to speak, out of my IRA and mm-hmm. pay into my reverse mortgage mm-hmm. to be able to get a tax deduction. Got it. But now my payments just turned in from a required payment to an optional payment because I have over 50% equity and I'm over 62. Mm. So statistically, FHA insurance is going to cover me because they know that I'm probably not going to live to 150. I'm going to die somewhere around 87, according to the actuarial people. Mm-hmm. If I'm healthy at 62, there's no health underwriting, but rough numbers, average. Right. And they also know that the value of my house will probably go up over the mm-hmm. next 20, 30 years. So they're willing to guarantee that with a 2% mortgage insurance fee that I pay at the beginning out of my equity. A one time, lump be- sum. One time, okay. yes. Cool. There's ongoing fees with the um, interest and the MIP, but I only have to pay that 2% What's MIP? once. Uh, oh, mortgage insurance premium. Oh, okay. So there's a half percent. So if my rate is 6%, percent five and a half goes to the bank, a half percent goes to the mortgage insurance fund for okay. FHA. Okay. So a lot of times people say, well, this is too good to be true. Well, no, it's insured. So there's right. a guarantee that is because of this insurance fund that if I die in 2009 or I live to be 100 and the house is upside down, my kids don't have to worry about paying the upside down amount, or me if I'm So still who alive. takes it? The bank would take it and it would go into foreclosure or something like that and be a bank owned, it bank owned be, sale? It'd just be a, it could be, but it, it primarily the kids are gonna sell it on a short sale. Okay. That's guaranteed, okay. because it was already agreed upon that if the house isn't Got worth it. that much, they can sell it for 95% right. of the appraised value. So let me see if I understand this properly, just the, the math behind it. So. You get a 62-year-old with over 50%. Let's say I, there's somebody with 60% equity. Mm-hmm. Do they have access to 10%? Yes. If they That's qualify they, for 50, and let's say the mortgage balance is 300, okay. and they qualify for 400, we'll pay off the 300 and then give them 100,000 in cash or in a line of credit. So you'll give them you'll give them out of that number. So they need to have at least 50% equity to qualify, but you'll give them a reverse mortgage for the full value of the house. No, no, only 50% of only the value 50. of the house. Only yes. 50. So, so from that perspective, that's pretty insulated for the company as well. It is right away because at 50%. Even if the market crashes 40%, you're still, right. the mortgage isn't upside down. So right, it's speak. not a huge risk at that point. Got it. Okay. So that's group one, people that are still making a mortgage payment. That's yeah. 44% of uh, anybody over 62 is still making a mortgage payment. Okay. 
So they, those people are going to use the mortgage like I did to just eliminate my payment to create cash flow and put the money in other places. Mm. Fun stuff, investing, whatever else I want to do with it because mm -hmm. I no longer have the requirement to make that payment every month. Group two has their house paid off. Mm -hmm. They've uh, had the mortgage burning party. They're excited about having their house free and clear. I've heard that yeah, yeah. thousands of times. My yeah. house is free oh, and clear. Oh, totally, totally. And uh, I always say I'm sorry to hear that. Not because I'm being sarcastic or rude, but I'm sorry to hear that you've got eight hundred thousand dollars of equity that you can't use. It's, I I saw a statistic the other day, not to go off track, but and I don't. This wasn't for retirees, but this was just across the board. Seventy four percent of Americans' net worth right now is held in their equity in their home. It's eleven trillion dollars just for the people over sixty two. Trillion with a T. That's insane. there's never been that much money in one asset class, in any asset class in the history of the world. Our country has $11 trillion in one asset class. That's more money than people have in IRAs. That's... And more, certainly more money than they have in cash value life insurance. Yeah. Because they've been programmed to put it all there. Yeah, I mean... From they the time just, they're young. Yeah, and it's like the least efficient place that you... So let's speak to that for a second. Like, why? Why? Because I've done videos on this, by the way, on like how to efficiently pay off your house and like manage it all as you're going through the accumulation years. Now, just principally speaking, why is your home not a good place to keep your net worth? Well, it's a great place to store people, um, and you want to be able to store people. That's the primary purpose of a house. Mm -hmm. Because I ask people, what's really weird is you ask people, why are you making a mortgage payment? And it takes a while for them to reply. It's like, well, because you have to. Because I don't want to get kicked out, that's why. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so I don't want to be homeless living under the bridge, that's why. But you can do that with rent. Sure. Why don't you just go rent a house and you're sure. guaranteed not to be kicked out if you pay the landlord That's true. every single month. So you're really doing it because you assume that the house is going to go up in value. If everybody knew houses were going to go down in value over a long period of time, they would not buy a house. Of course. They'd rent and let somebody else take the loss. Totally. So you're buying it as an investment and as a place to live. Mm -hmm. It's not just a place to live. It is mm -hmm. also an investment for the future. And in many cases, it's one of the biggest investments that people have ever made and one mm -hmm. of the biggest appreciation. So the issue is, is that if you're putting a lot of cash into it, you're giving up the power of the lever. And I don't know if the lever or the wheel came first, but the levers are really powerful. And the lever of being able to own a $600,000 house by only putting 5% down or 10% down or 20% down. 3.5% now is some FHA. And loans. that's what I programmed all of my kids. Don't you ever put down more than 5%. Yeah. And they argued with me and said, well, yeah, but we got 20 we and we'll to. avoid MIP. Yeah. That, that horrible mortgage insurance. I said, yeah. it doesn't matter. You'll make more on the other side by not investing the money into your house because your house always gives you a 0% rate of return except for the interest rate that you're paying off. So if your interest rate is 2.5%, you're guaranteed to only get a 2.5% interest rate. Mm -hmm. and people say, oh, no, not now. Houses have went up by 8, 10, 15%. Your house will go up 8, 10, 15% whether you have a mortgage or not. Totally. So it has nothing to do with the appreciation of your house. It only right. has to do with the interest that you're saving. Yep. So if it costs me 2% interest, but I can earn more than that somewhere else, yeah. then why would I pay off my house? Right. And not just that, like when you look at inflation, you know, I, we've got like a 3.15% mortgage, right? And I know some people have in the twos right now and some people even in, in the fours right now, historically speaking, that's like the cheapest money you're ever going to find. And when you look at appreciation and when you look at just inflation and what that does to home prices, you're basically getting a discount on your mortgage every single year because mm -hmm. you know you have a two thousand dollar payment right now and you know 20 years from now you have a two thousand dollar payment it's not going to feel like two thousand dollars today you're locking that in so that's one of the good parts about buying compared to renting because you're going to absolutely cost of living standard of living all that stuff mm -hmm. you can owning a home certainly allows you to do that but having your home as the primary place for your net worth you know, it, it's it's not it's just not the most efficient way to do it, and so. Um, well, and a we, lot of people we, found that out in two thousand nine. Yeah, after totally, the crash. Totally. Because all, all of a sudden their equity vanished, and sometimes they owed more money on the house than what it was worth. Uh, a lot of times, I, I think most situations yes. in, in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, that happened. I lived in a little town just in uh, in Arizona. Here, it was actually the number one foreclosure town in the country. Wow. 73% of the homes in our town got foreclosed. Wow. And I remember going through that position. My wife and I, we bought our first house there when we were 24, and it was $132,000 I remember buying. It was like, we're brilliant because we built it, 
And by the time we moved in six months later after buying it and getting it under contract, of course, and then you got to wait and you get the mortgage on it. We locked in the price at 132. By the time we moved in, it was like 190. And we're like, we're brilliant. Like this, <laughs> this game is easy. We're going to be rich, you know, this and that. And, you know, 24 years old, already got the $60,000 in net worth, you know, like whatever. And then literally within two years, it was up to like 390. And then we're like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Like we got to figure out what to do. And I started talking like we should sell, we should like, you know, whatever, cash out and take that money, do something cool with it. And we just didn't because it's an emotional thing, right? right? And one of the biggest regrets of my life is not selling. And then literally by the time we came to the conclusion that we wanted to, it was 2007 when everything started going down and we literally started dropping the price $10,000 a week and we couldn't keep up. Within six months, we couldn't sell the house for $92,000. Wow. That's how bad it got. A lot of people have forgotten about that. I don't forget about that. I'll tell you right now, I don't <laughs> forget about too many that. People. I mean, there are people right now who say, yeah, yeah, I won't do my reverse mortgage now. I'll just yeah. wait for a few years. Yeah. Well, how much is your house going to be worth in a few years? Maybe it'll be up higher. It's, well, you know, not. and, and I, I mean, this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but, you know, I, nobody knows what's going on with the stock market, with the real estate market, with, with any kind of investment like this. The problem is what got us here isn't gonna work long-term. The market is cyclical, right? So we all know these short-terms. I talk a lot about these, you know, eight to 12 year cycles where the market goes up and it crashes and it goes up and it crashes. Yeah, it's gonna trend up and that's great. But then there are longer cycles. And we've been in this cycle where if you go back to the late seventies, you were, you know, around and, you know, productive at that point in time, I was just getting born. But like, when you go there, Paul Volcker raised the federal funds rate to 19% in 1979. 1980 and from that point forward and 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 that caused a lot of calamity financially for a lot of people but we had to purge all the bad debt from the inflationary 70s and reset a foundation to allow the economy to be healthy right yes so what happened was we've been living for 40 years 50 almost or 45 years almost off of one man's tough decision to cause short term pain and we've had long term gain but now we're at the end of this cycle where 2008, interest rates had been dropping for 40 years. What it, interest rates dropping just pushes prices up, right? Mm -hmm. And so we now live in an environment where quantitative tightening is gonna probably have to happen. Interest rates are gonna go up to do so. How is that gonna impact real estate? Nobody knows, right? All I know is if one of the things that we talk about a lot is control. And one of the things that you talk about with the reverse mortgages that really resonates me, with me is control, mm -hmm. right? And the fact that if you're reaching your retirement years, when you have all your equity tied up in your home, and, and tell me if, if I'm in alignment with the reverse mortgage thing here, if you own a home or have a high percentage of, of equity in that home and you're doing that, you're taking on all that risk. Mm -hmm. my, all of it. My assumption with a reverse mortgage is, and tell me if I'm wrong, but my assumption is after hearing your talk is that by getting a reverse mortgage, you're shifting that risk to the bank. You're getting access to a portion of that money on a guaranteed basis. And yes, I mean, the, the bank is gonna make it so you keep 50% equity in the home. So that's a little bit of a buffer, but anything I can do to, to transition some of that risk from myself to the bank and not have to give up control of that money. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm gonna have more control of that money. More control. Because I have access to it if I need it. Mm -hmm. Because now if the market goes down, best time to buy is when everything's low and ride it back up. Now I have liquidity use and control of that money mm -hmm. so I can lever it, you know, I, even if you don't wanna to touch it, use it as an opportunity fund yes. for when times are tough, right? So am I, am I, it, you're exactly, you understand it better than some people that have went through our 16 hour training. Okay. Um, oh, cool. So you got that down. <laughs> the issue is, is that if I've got a somewhere between 40 to 60% is the loan to value, depending upon age, yeah. interest rate and everything else. Yeah. So let's just use easy figuring for uh, 500,000 on a million dollar house. Mm -hmm. If I've got a million dollar house, I can only control 500,000 of it and still live in the house. So I yeah. get $500,000 in a line of credit, guaranteed that mm -hmm. I have access to that money no matter what happens to the market. So my house value goes down, the stock market goes down, up, whatever, interest rates increase, doesn't matter. I always have that guaranteed amount of money, which mm -hmm. is guaranteed to grow every year in the line of credit. This is the second group of people that I was talking about that have their house paid off. So now they have access to, let's say, 500,000. 
which then every year goes up by another thirty thousand dollars. So okay. next year it's worth five thirty, the year after that it's worth five sixty, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that's guaranteed to go up and because you didn't use the money. Got it. But then when I if the value of my house goes down, I have a hundred percent access to that money no matter what happens, whether I've got fifty percent equity or twenty percent equity or zero equity. Mm -hmm. I did a reverse mortgage for a client that bought a two hundred thousand dollar condo in Las Vegas in two thousand seven. Okay. He had one hundred and twenty thousand dollars in a line of credit. The value of the condo went down to fifty grand. I was going to say that's not going to be free. <laughs> okay. He still had one hundred and twenty. And they so the bank took that risk on. Yes. Like on and that that's well, huge. it's not the bank; it's the mortgage insurance fund. Okay. All right. However, if there was never a claim. Is that backed up, by the way, the mortgage insurance fund? It's, because like, if it's, it's backed only up got by the Federal Housing Administration, it is okay. Yes. So, so it's so like kind of FDIC ish. Like there's an equivalent. Very similar. Some, so it put it in terms FHA. of people. But FHA. FHA is yep. backs it up. Very it's similar to that. So if okay. our company would go out of business, yep. or any bank would go out of business, yep. the federal government is the only ones that can print money. Okay. And they're guaranteeing that, but they have a fund. So the mortgage insurance fund never went under in 2009. Okay. Not even a, a little bit because the there were, weren't enough claims to offset all the money that was in the fund. Hmm. Even though a lot of my uncle died in two thousand nine and his, he was forty thousand dollars upside down, it, it didn't matter. That was just paid out. Yeah. The other three hundred thousand that he had in insurance and annuities mm -hmm. went to his kids. Mm hmm. And and so there was no loss so, there. So let's talk about this for a second because this is my world now, right? Like we talk about the insurance stuff, it, like leverage, right? Mm -hmm. That's the other thing I always talk about with, with the presentations that I give is a, a, a control and leverage. Mm -hmm. it, like any asset that you have should provide leverage. And once again, we've never talked about this, right? Mm -hmm. Like so I, I'm feeling this out as I'm, I'm thinking through this. But leverage, um, it, it seems like a reverse mortgage would provide leverage because of the fact that if, uh, if I'm gonna inherit a home from, let's say my father-in-law, my mother-in-law, my parents, or you know either side of the family, I guess it doesn't matter, but if I'm gonna inherit a home, I don't wanna inherit the home. I mean, we'd, like, I, I'd rather have cash and have simplicity or mm -hmm. you know, whatever, but even if I'm going to, if, let, let's say they had the home paid off, $500,000 home, mm -hmm. completely paid off, they could go get a reverse mortgage, take, $250,000 of that, buy a single premium life insurance policy if they wanted to, even if like they could do a lot of different things with it. And that single premium life insurance policy is gonna buy them probably a million and a half to $2 million worth of life insurance, mm -hmm. right? And so now I've taken this $500,000 home that I would get and I've, I've accessed half of the equity, not even all of it, so leveraging half of it to create a multiple effect as far as generational wealth creation. Now, if I do it the right way with a whole life policy, there's a lot of things that we could do to still have some access to that capital, that $250,000 at the same time. So am I missing anything? Well, a lot of life insurance companies, there, there was a problem prior to 2008 mm -hmm. where people were pulling money with a forward mortgage. Yeah. And some people in your industry- Equity harvesting. Yes. Yes. And became equity stripping. Yeah. Because they took it out, put it somewhere else, mm -hmm. both things went down, and then they lost their house because they couldn't yeah. afford to make the payments. Yeah. Reverse mortgage never requires payments. Right. So that risk isn't there. But most life insurance companies will not accept money from a, uh, life in, or from a reverse mortgage because they don't okay. want to accept any borrowed money. Got because it. Because they went all the way across. However, a lot of people have money in other investments that if they free that up, we become their new cash account. Got it. And so it allows them to take money from an IRA or money from another source that is their safe money, mm. their, their blanket money. Mm -hmm. They can now invest that into a, 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 a single premium life policy that gives them long-term care coverage and a death benefit. Got it. Yeah. And so it's just a matter of how that's done Love it. from the regulation standpoint. Okay. Yeah. So that's just... We're not encouraging taking money out and investing it. That's totally. what I'm saying. But yeah, yeah. It, if we're another source of that money, because people say, I always want to keep like $100,000 just there yeah. so that I can just get at it. Yep. Well, it's already in their house. Mm -hmm. It's already sitting there in their living room. We'll mm -hmm. just wave a magic wand and create that cash of availability so that it gives them comfort to invest their other money. All right. Whether it be in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, whether it be in life insurance, whether it be in annuities, whether it be in fun stuff. I mean, one guy bought yeah, a Corvette. Yeah. 
Yeah, nice. Because he That's always awesome. wanted to collect her car, but he didn't sure. want to take it out of his IRA. Totally. Because he was relying on that money. He didn't want to take it out of his cash value life insurance because that was kind of for the kids and for his money. Well, it's leverage, it's control. Control because you can control more of your cash flow. Control because you can, I mean, from every perspective, it's, it's just going to give you more control. Um, it puts you in the driver's seat. You don't, the, the other thing that I'm thinking, it just kind of hit my, my mind is nothing is guaranteed. When you hit 62, health things come out of nowhere. My father-in-law was diagnosed with cancer, you know, like things happen out of nowhere. And, you know, I've said hundreds of times, uh, the only thing certain about the future is that it's uncertain. Yeah, totally. And what is shocking to me that in the most vulnerable period of life, 44% of people have still committed to making a mortgage payment until they're 70, 80 years mm -hmm. old. Now, my son and his wife, from 30 to 60, that's a pretty safe time. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if somebody dies, they'll probably get remarried or the one job is gonna take care of it. From 62 to 92, that's a precarious time. Mm -hmm. Somebody, the chance of my income going up from 62 to 92 is highly unlikely mm. because for the average person, one person is gonna die, for the average couple, one person's gonna die, somebody's gonna get sick between 62 and 92, and your income's going to go down. And mm -hmm. there's gonna be healthcare costs. And that is a huge issue that most people do not plan for. Yeah. So that, uh, taking on a mortgage or not having access to the equity in the house is one of the most dangerous things you can do from 62 to 92. I'm with you, and totally. In my dad's time period in 1981 when he retired, He's getting 15% on his CDs. In, wow. in 1981, I'm paying 16.5% for my first house. We refinanced. Yeah, yeah, in, yeah. In 1980, my second son was born, Josh, was born May 12, 1990, front page USA Today in the hospital gift shop. Mortgage rates dropped to 9.9%, sparking a refi boom. That is funny. 9.9. <laughs> and now, if you mention six to some millennial, People they'll are freak freaking out. out. Yeah. It, it, with, with the inflation is that, which what you were saying earlier, yeah. it's free. So if I take out, I looked at my mortgage. My mortgage is 480000 mm -hmm. By the time I am uh, in my 80, uh, or my 75th year, it'll be a million dollars of accrued interest. Got it. Well, what is a million dollars worth 18 years from now? Yeah, that depends on inflation. Right. That's, that's, it could be free. There, yeah, 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 totally. And, and so in the whole scheme of things, why do I care? But if it's not free, to finish the story about the guy in Las Vegas, he bought, he had a $120,000 line of credit. He bought his neighbor's condo, who yep. sold it for 50 grand. Yep. And so when everything came out of it, he had, he had cash. I, when everything came I, out of it, he had two condos. I love it. I preach this, like, I feel like until I'm blue in the face, is having an opportunity fund is one of the most important things that you can have if you want to catapult your wealth forward. Like, one of the things that drives me crazy about financial planning in general, is this notion that you should, that two, two things. The younger you are, the more risk you can take, which I think is the most dangerous financial advice on the face of the earth that most people believe. Yeah. Because, yeah. Well, I, most financial advisors have told them that. Right, so, and, and I understand the notion of it, like if I'm young and I lose money, I have more time to make up for it, but the younger you are, the less risk you have to take because you have so much time on your side, like go, get good consistent wins, just be consistent, hit a plan, like whatever, so that's it. So that's one thing, and then the other component is just buy and hold. Like mm -hmm. buy and hold assets, the market's gonna be up, it's gonna be down, ride it out. When I know for a fact, and there's literally hundreds of years of history with this that the market is cyclical, right? Mm -hmm. Every eight to 12 years, we're gonna have a boom and a bust cycle, and during, those, during that bust period in that time, because of the fact that people are not structured financially in a way to take advantage of opportunity, they wind up being, you know, like everybody else, and they they wind up just focused on survival. So they take, they, you can go, and we're we're gonna see it now. I promise you. Like, look around. Everybody has this false sense of security right now, right? Very false. And so we we see this market. We we're coming out of a 13-year bull run, right? Like everything's just been going awesome. Everybody's got this sense of like, oh, the market does nothing but go up. People have forgotten how bad it got. They, they've, they've, they have forgotten the emotional feeling what it is like to have your house go down 70% in value in six months. And I mean, granted that didn't happen to everybody, but it, it can happen again. The people don't realize that. And like, it's just one of those things where when that happens, like 
it, I mean, I guess I, I believe it's going to happen again unequivocally. 95% of people are going to struggle. And when 95% of people are struggling, it creates a lot of opportunity for people that are prepared. And so my, what really drives me nuts about the financial industry is if we know that these cycles are going to happen, why is it not baked into everybody's financial plan to just be really safe and wait for better opportunity? Yeah. Uh, you know, the number of things, I talked to Nelson Nash early mm. in my uh, uh, planning yeah. back in my 30s and 40s. Love it. And Nelson said, I said, but I don't like the return on investment and life insurance policies. It's just so low. Yeah. How can you explain that to me? And, and Nelson said, liquidity is more important than your return Amen. rate of return. He said, I can go back through my life and take a look at what I, opportunities I was able to take advantage of because mm. I had cash when other people did not. Amen. And I, I, I got an incredible screaming deal on an office building that mm. we still have mm -hmm. because that we bought for probably somewhere around 100000 out of a foreclosure that's now worth over a million. That's awesome. Because I had cash value in my life insurance policy and mm -hmm. because I did not pay off my house. What people don't realize, if you pay off your house, I couldn't pull money out in the bad nope. times. Nope. And even it's, if I yeah. could, in the mortgage industry, being able to do my own loans, it still takes three to four weeks to get money yeah, out of your house. You, you, and, and the opportunity probably pass you by. Exactly. Exactly. And so the more money that I have in cash instead of stuck in my house, because people say, I got control over the money in my house. Uh, the only control you have is being able to go to a bank and beg for money yeah. or go to a realtor and ask them to put the house up for sale. Yep. Those are the only, that, that, and so that's not your control. It's the realtor yeah. and the banker. No, I love it. Or, or the market. It's, it's, it's so true. And, and so that's, that's the thing is like being, having, I, I always tell people, if you are prepared, if you have it, the opportunities will find you. And I can say it's, it's like 100% of the time, if you are willing, one of the principles I was told, I'll say it this way, one of the principles I was told that when I was trying to learn this is, Chris, sometimes you gotta slow down to go fast, right? Amen. People are trying to just get these massive returns, buy the hype, do all this stuff. And my encouragement to everybody, I don't care what stage of the journey you're on, if you feel like you're too far behind, if you feel like you can't get there, if you're willing to slow down to go fast and build a good solid foundation, like there are principles, I'll call them biblical principles, mm -hmm. that are absolute, even when it comes to our money. If you build your house on sand, a storm comes, you're gonna get wiped out. You build mm -hmm. it on a foundation of stone, and solidification, you know, like whatever. I, I, I do a talk, it's called the Life 180 Pyramid. You know, the, the foundation of your pyramids yeah. have lasted thousands of years, right? Like, and it's not by accident. It's because of how they're built and it's because of their shape. And it's, you know, if we do it the right way, it, it's gonna last. And so I, I just, I'm a big believer that if people are willing to slow down and by slowing down in the financial industry, I mean, save first. Stop trying to go out and invest. Save your money first, prepare get your emergency fund built, build an opportunity fund, and don't feel like you have to keep up with the Joneses because those Joneses that have right now, right now, feel really good because they've got a couple hundred K in their 401k and they've saved over the last 13 years and things feel really good. Well, guess what? In the next 12 months or 24 months, nobody has a time frame on it, but next time the market crashes and goes down and they lose their job and their 401k goes down 50%, and they have to liquidate those assets just to survive because they didn't structure their life and they didn't have an emergency fund and they weren't prepared. Now they're gonna wind up 14 years later after feeling really good with nothing starting from scratch. And if that happens to you once over a 40 year retirement planning journey, you're screwed. Yes. Yeah, if you live to be a thousand, it doesn't matter. You can live through that stuff, but that doesn't yeah. happen. You don't have enough time. Exactly. And, and that's what we find now with people that, are, there's two different people we're working with, the people that um, are younger, that want to pay off their mortgage. Mm -hmm. And so they're putting a, a ridiculous amount of money into a 2.5% investment that's illiquid, really? which makes zero sense because they say, oh, now that we've got extra money and we're making more money, we're just gonna pay off our mortgage because we can do it faster, which is a horrible mistake, but there's a big trend toward even younger wow. people that were doing 15-year mortgages that are now paying extra on 15-year mortgages. How are they gonna get that money back out yeah. if there's a market downturn? They're not. And then we've yep. got the people in my age group that are saying, well, we're gonna pull the money from our IRA, the 401k, we're just gonna start living more carefully, but we're not gonna to touch our house because we're so glad we got that paid off. Yep. And then they're not using the money that is readily accessible from the house. And there's so much synergy between life insurance 
and reverse mortgages and housing wealth. Yep. Because the more money that we put in our house, the less money that we have to put into life insurance. And sometimes I will tell people that are taking notes, just write down that the more money that you put into your house, the less money you have to put elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, why did I write that down? Because people don't think about how obvious that is. Yeah, if totally. I'm gonna put a whole bunch of money into equity, yep. And, and people say, well, I have to put some money in debt. Yes, you do if, yeah. you don't, if you don't put money in, but don't put in any extra. People are paying extra on 15-year mortgage payments. Yep. Why? Yep. Yep. Why would you pay that off? Yep. No, I agree with you. And, well. and so now you don't have the cash. And what people don't realize is that uh, even now, they'll say, if I need money, I can, you know, it's, it's easy to get money. I've got good credit and I can get money whenever. Mm -hmm. When COVID hit, uh, billions in lines of credit were canceled in April of 2020. I know, yeah. And we, yep. we could not, our company completely, the, the markets froze up to the point for about three months that we could not do cash out refis. It's crazy. Right. Uh, and that's when we bought a house because we still had cash Yeah. Uh, on our second home. Yep. So, yep. Uh, because you couldn't get money out of your equity. If I would have had it all stuck there, even though I'm in the mortgage You'd business, I could not get at it. Yeah, exactly. It, it's, it's locked up. Yep. No, so, I feel you, man. And, and people just think, well, I've got it and that's safe. Yep. And no, somebody else is in control of it. Yep. No, I love it, man. Well, I tell you what, this has been awesome. Uh, thanks for being here. I'll have to have you back on again because these are just, I mean, these principles, like, I I'm still learning about all this, but it seems like a really good, you know, a really good match. And I'm going to keep doing the deep dive. The one thing that I want to say before I go is one of the things that you said to me yesterday when we were talking is that Dr. Wade Fowl has written some books on this. And so, um, what I would encourage anybody to do, and I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit, but I, you kind of said it was okay. Um, I'm going to put a link in the description below if anybody wants to get a hold of you, A. And B, you said you're happy to hand out books to educate people mm -hmm. about this stuff. So uh, is like, I'll just, we'll work out the deals, uh, details on all that. I'll put all the information in the description below. Um, and if well, anybody well, wants got, to get a hold of got, you. We've got three main books. The first book is Wade Fowles' book, which yep. is like a term paper, and it's boring, uh, but it's all the facts. But he's Just brilliant. The facts. He's like, as far as math goes, guy. he's like, Psh. You can't argue yeah. with the math. Yep, yep. Uh, the second book is uh, someone that I work with here at Fairway and Dan Holquist. He writes a book every year on the basics of reverse mortgage, just okay. understanding the machinery of it. Yep. My book is the Cinderella book, which is simply about the emotional attachment that we have to home equity and okay. how reverse mortgages fit into your overall uh, planning and how home equity fits into your planning. Cool. A any of those books that somebody wants, we want to share with your listeners That's... because we're not into selling books. We're into helping yeah. people with their Educate we're, people. We're the mortgage business to be able to help people how to properly use them. Yeah. The mortgage is one of the most powerful tools, and people don't know how to use it, yeah. kind of like life insurance. Yeah. Totally. And, and I think that's one of the things that drew me to you and wanted to have you on here and do this kind of impromptu interview is because you're focused on educating people. And that's that's got to be the foundation of everything. And so um, that's awesome. Well, hey, man, thanks hey, for, have, thanks for being here. It's a blast. Thank hey, guys, you. if you have any questions at all, comment in the comment section below. If you haven't already, make sure you follow the channel, hit the subscribe button, click that bell. That way you get notified every time we launch a new video. Until next time, have a blessed, inspirational day. We'll talk soon. See ya.